get <clears throat> started tonight. Um, is this on? Yeah. Very good. All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you always uh, for your presence with us. We're thankful for your truth. We're thankful that it is unchanging, forever truth. And we're thankful that you are summing up all things in Jesus Christ, and that's a great hope that we have. So bless our time together. Bless us as we talk about different ways of looking at uh, theology, biblical theology. And uh, we ask your blessing to be upon us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're moving to talk about <clears throat> um, biblical theology. We talk, We said systematic theology is about different parts of the Bible, different truths in the Bible, like Christ and sin or the things to come or any number of subjects. Biblical theology is how the Bible all fits together. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a fourth one. And I don't want you to take any notes on this because this is crazy. Well, it's not crazy, but it's just something you know, we're looking at trying to make um, the whole of the Bible fit together. And I'm going to show you a way that the whole of the Bible fits together, but it's just not, a, it, it would not be a good one. Nobody, this is just off the top of my head. It's not anything more than that. But it looks, here we have this. And you can think, well, let's, let's look at, the names and the presence of God. This is true in the Bible. And uh, in the beginning, all the way up to, to Abraham, you have, uh, all the way up to Moses, rather, you have God revealing himself, as it says in Exodus, as El Shaddai. Mighty God. And the appearances were a theophany where he would come and appear and eat breakfast with Abraham, with the two angels, and he would come, have breakfast, tell him what he's going to do with reference to the cities of the plain. And then he leaves. And uh, when he was talking to Moses, he said, uh, uh, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the people in the past, knew me as El Shaddai. But now they will know me as Yahweh and the great I Am. Well, Yahweh is revealed in Genesis chapter 2. So there's nothing new about Yahweh, but he's talking about how he dwells with his people. And so you have God dwelling in the midst of Israel. So in the middle was the tabernacle, and all the tribes were around the tabernacle. And as they traveled through the wilderness, God was dwelling in the midst of his people. And when the cloud moved, they moved, because the king moved. And when he stopped, then they would pitch camp. And they'd stay as long as the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night stayed. But if it started to move again, they're moving again. And God is dwelling in the midst of his people. He's behind the veils in the tabernacle, but he is there in the midst of his people. Then you come to Jesus Christ, and he, he comes the incarnation and uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and baptism into Jesus Christ. And, and you go from Christ dwelling in the midst of his people to Christ dwelling in our hearts. So in one sense, you could look and say, well, let's look at this whole thing and we can define it in terms of the names of God. Nobody ever does that. Because I, I, I don't, this would not be a really good way of explaining the whole of the Bible. It certainly explains the names of God, and, and God's name is always the same in, in every period of time. But it's sort of interesting to see how God first would come and go, and then God would dwell in the midst of his people, and then God dwells in our hearts. And the way I, when I'm talking about this, the way I would say this is, there are times when I would love to go back in time and see the things that happen. I would like to see what it is like to go through the the Red Sea, the parting of the waters and going through. I would like to see some of the miracles in the Old Testament. I would like to see Elijah and Elisha and some of the things taking place. I'd like to see the miracles that Jesus performed. I would like to go back, but I don't want to go back to not having 
God dwelling in me and me dwelling in God. That is a progressive thing that clearly can be seen. And all I'm saying is, this is just everything that I put on here, I think is true, but it just doesn't explain all of the Bible. It doesn't explain why you have Israel, mankind, church, and the millennial kingdom. It doesn't explain any of that. It just explains something else. So there are three main ways of explaining what it is that God is doing. And the first is covenant theology, dispensational theology, and promise theology. And what I want you to know about this, well, there are several things I want you to know about this. Uh, the Dutch theologian Johannes Coseus um, in the 1600s wrote a couple of books, The Doctrine of the Covenant of the Testament of God, and um, that is in Latin, I believe. Um, but he wrote this on covenant theology, and his emphasis is on the doctrine of, of salvation. My emphasis on that first one was the names of God, not the very good. This is, this is really good. Covenant theology is really good. And, but it's important just to know the major theme of covenant theology is soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Dispensationalism uh, was originated with uh, a couple of individuals in um, Irving and Darby, um, later than the covenant theology, and uh, Schofield popularized this in America. But it focuses in upon man and stewards of time that man is tested, tried, and fails throughout human history. And the focus is upon anthropology. Promise theology is even later than that. Walt Kaiser um, of Evangelical Seminary in Chicago um, wrote a book, Promise Plan of God. And his focus is, I think, the best focus. This is just me speaking. Um, because it focuses on the Christology. And I think tracing Christology through the past is key to understanding the whole of the Bible. Having said that, I have learned a lot from covenant theology, dispensational theology, and promise theology. And there are things about those that I think are weaker, but not wrong. Just weaker, I would say. And ways that looking things that I don't quite look at. When I was at Dallas Seminary, Dallas Seminary was a dispensational school. I've said this before, but they used to make jokes about covenant theology. They used to say, you know, the covenant theologians are not going to have a prophecy conference this year. Well, their prophecy is real simple. He's a Lord comes and judgment and you're done. So, I mean, they don't have prophecy conferences, but they were always in every, everyone at Dallas Seminary was ha, 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 ha. So I went to a Banner of Truth conference where they're all millennial in Michigan one time, shortly after Trinity Bible Church got started. And a bunch of elders and my dad and I went to this conference. And they were making jokes about dispensationalism. And they would make a joke about, oh, yeah, those dispensationalists, ha, 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 ha. And I just think, all of that is wrong. I, I don't like any of that because you can learn from all of these. So I don't, you know, my favorite, my one that I think is really the, the best is promise theology. I don't throw the other two out the window. And it's hard for people to understand because they say, well, those others are not, there's things about them that are not preferable or something. And I say that may be true, but just remember this. All three emphasize the primary purpose of knowing God. All three of them would say, knowing God and the glory of God. Knowing God to the glory of God. It, that's what God is doing. This whole thing from creation to the end, beginning to the end, is God revealing himself in whatever happens between those two things so that we come through that and have a better knowledge of God than you ever had before. That's true of every single one of those. 
Second thing I would say is all three of these systems address the doctrine of God, Christ, man, sin, and salvation. They talk about all of them. And they talk in different ways about them, but they are, for the most part, they are biblical in all the ways that they talk about. They, they have all the parts. That's what I want to say. And all are orthodox, meaning right doctrine. So I don't say, well, if somebody is a covenant theologian, they're not saved. I just don't, or a dispensational, you know, I went to a dispensational seminary, that's how I, I just, you need to understand that these are not equal. I think you're going to, there's differences in them so that you will have one that you will like more than the other. But the whole point is to explain what's going on in all of the Bible. And each one emphasizes a unique biblical theme. Soteriology, anthropology, or Christology. But just because soteriology is emphasized, it doesn't mean that they don't emphasize anthropology or the condition of man. They do. And just because you have anthropology doesn't mean they're not talking about soteriology. And, and they should be talking about, all should be talking about the end times as well. And Christology just focuses upon the promise and provision. But I'll just, I want to give you these in very broad pictures. So I want to talk about covenant theology. Covenant theology has three covenants that are emphasized. The first is the covenant of redemption. This is the covenant that you would find in Ephesians chapter 1, where God, before the foundation of the world, determined the divine purpose, the plan, and also the people of the plan, those whom he will save. He foreknew, uh, he chose, and he predetermined, he predecreed, he predestined. All of that in the eternity past. Is that true? Yes, that's true. And so they speak of the covenant of redemption. Does the Bible speak of it as the covenant of redemption? No. But does the Bible mention the word trinity? The answer is no. But Trinity is a theological term, and the covenant of redemption is a theological term, and it's very true. So it begins with this God who decrees and determines that which he will do. And I wholeheartedly agree that that's true. The second of these covenants is the covenant of works. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden. God said, you are the stewards of the earth. The stewards of the earth. That means you're in charge of the whole earth. And when Adam and Eve were there, another way you can say it, they're the king and queen of the whole earth. But God says there's one tree over there, and in the Garden of Eden, there were trees all over the place. But he said that one tree, you see that tree right there? That tree, I don't want you to eat of that tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to eat that tree. Was it a poison tree? No. Was it anything different from all the other trees? No. But God said that's the tree and that's the name of that tree. And he said don't eat of it. Because you may be stewards of the whole of this earth and you may be king and queen of all of the earth, but you're not king and queen over God. You're still under his authority. And that one tree demonstrates this that you are under God's authority. You are not God. You are made in the image and likeness of God. You are his representative here upon the earth. But you're under his authority. And Adam was told, and Adam told Eve. And when he told Eve, he even added something to it. He said, I don't even want you to touch the tree. But they failed. And Eve was deceived. Adam uh, was disobedient. And so this, the, the idea of a covenant of works is that they were keeping themselves in a state of goodness by their work of not eating of the tree. As long as they did not eat of the tree, you would say, well, that's kind of 
doing the wrong kind of work, but I'm just saying they didn't have to do any, they didn't have to make themselves good, they didn't have to make themselves better, they just had to not eat the tree, and when you eat of the tree, you're disobeying God. And so as long as Adam and Eve said, that's the tree, I always think of this tree, when they walk by that tree, that would be like a worship tree, because they're saying, that is a tree that represents God's authority, God's dominion, the fact that God is God. And so be it, and you walk by the tree. You don't touch it, you don't eat it. But they did. And they were deceived by Satan. And so then you have this fall, and you have the covenant of grace. And the covenant of grace sometimes emphasized four covenants, like Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Christ in the new covenant. Sometimes uh, the covenant theologians talk about Noah. Sometimes uh, um, they might even talk about the, the promise of, of uh, Genesis 3.15. Um, but these, all these covenants of grace are an explanation of all that God does in fixing this problem. So in other words, you have God's plan and his provision of the tree, and there's a problem. And the, the, doctor, the grace, covenants of grace, are the solution to that problem. And so, Reformed theology is a system which views the covenant as a pledge between two parties by an oath as the overarching theme of biblical revelation. So, obviously, you have the covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. What I don't like about their view of the covenant of grace there's a couple things. One is it tends to make the covenants all the same. The sameness of the covenants is one of the critiques that you can have of covenant theology. I don't really like that. Furthermore, I think that the Mosaic covenant is a covenant of works. And most of covenant theologians don't view that as a covenant of works, at least most of the ones that I've talked to. So I, just see, I see some distinctions, a different kind of distinction in some of those, those covenants. I will say that most of the men that sit on my bookshelf at home are covenant theologians. Because when you're talking about the doctrine of salvation, you can't get any better than these men talking about uh, salvation, talking about propitiation, reconciliation, redemption, talking about uh, the doctrines of grace, talking about total depravity. Um, talking about the cross, talking about, they are really excellent. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And if you just buy books that the, are the best on the subject of salvation, you're going to end up with a lot of covenant theologians. I don't necessarily buy this whole system, but I certainly buy what they have to say. And there are many godly individuals that have bought into this, and they have done well, um, I will say of them. So I don't make fun of these. I don't make fun of this. You know, do they emphasize eschatology as much? Well, usually they're amillennial uh, or postmillennial. Um, the pilgrims that came to America were postmillennial. Uh, the Puritans that came to America were postmillennial. Um, but there are many of these who are just godly individuals. You come to the end, they'll talk about the end, but it's there's. There's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the judgment, separation of the sheep and goats, the judgment, and then new heavens and new earth and the eternal, eternal plan and purpose of God. Now, that's a basic view. There, there are many varieties of covenant theology, but that's the big picture. I think that's probably about the most accurate way of saying it in a general way. And I'm saying some people emphasize these other Abraham... Moses, Christ, and Adam, they emphasize different aspects of all of that. Go ahead. But that's probably a very good big picture of covenant theology. So if you picked up a book on systematic theology, would you say that that would lean more towards covenant theology? Could. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. There's some dispensationalists who have written some good covenant theology. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, they usually declare themselves what they are, and you can sort of figure it out pretty easily. But 
yeah, when, when you buy a book on eschatology, you're pretty much going to be talking to somebody who is dispensational or covenant theology, or, or presby promise theology, excuse me. So, but there are a lot of people who are all over the place on this. I mean, you, not everyone, if you said covenant theology to everyone or, or to everyone who were all the people in Presbyterian churches and all the rest, I'm not sure everyone has real clarity on all of these systems. I think it's good to have clarity on it. But, um, you know, this is just what it is. There's no mention of the covenant of grace. There's no mention of the covenant of works or the covenant of redemption in the Bible. Those are theological terms. I think a, a better thing is to follow the covenants. So I just personally, that's what I think. Any other questions about covenant theology? I don't, I don't have all the answers. Uh, denominations that you would say they were confessional. Is, does covenant theology and confessional go hand in hand or not necessarily? Um, <coughs> covenant theology and things go. Um, well, if the confession is amillennial and covenant theology, it, it is. Um, but you have different confessions. Um, you have the Westminster Confession, which is excellent. You have the Augsburg Confession, which is excellent. Um, and you have the London Confession, which is for the Baptists. So, you, you know, you won't find infant baptism or something like that in that. Um, I look at the confessions as a description of what people believed at a particular time. They are not authoritative. People sometimes will argue their theology by the confession. This is what the confession says. I think we ought to argue by the authority of Scripture. The confessions are, are what people are believing at a particular time. And there's wonderful things about the Westminster Confession. There's things about it that I don't hold to. And um, because I think the Bible says differently. So my reason for not disagreeing is not just because I don't like the Westminster Confession, because it's, it's a great confession. It's, it's well done. It's, it's sort of past the test of time. But I don't bind myself to confessions. Now, we have a doctrinal statement at this church, and we don't say to the people who come here, you have to agree to this doctrinal statement to be here. What we're saying is this is the position of the church. It's very broad, but it's, this is the position of the church. A doctrinal statement or a confession has never held any church or any school from going liberal because you just change it. I mean, we have a constitution of this nation, and it's written not to be changed. But we're changing it all over the place or ignoring it or doing other things. We view it as, many people view it as a, an old dusty doc, document that needs to be updated by the times. So, I mean, it's just, it depends upon the view, but um, covenant theologians are generally, as far as the future is concerned, are amill or post-mill, post and dispensationalists are primarily dispensationalists a lot because of the end times. So, and again, when you talk about eschatology and the things in the future, all of these views have all the parts, they just put them in different places. And that's very important where you put them. But they all have the same parts. When they start throwing out parts, then I would be, have a problem with them. In fact, I have a problem with them anyway, but I, if you start throwing out, saying, oh, Jesus is not coming again, or there's no final judgment, or there's no tribulation. You know, some people say the tribulation is 70 AD, some people say this tribulation is during the whole time of the church. Some people say this tribulation is future. That's what I think. Because I haven't seen anything in the past that represents what the book of Revelation describes since that time. But anyway, I'm just saying it, it's just the, people are all over the place. I mean, we have people at here that are amillennial. We have people here that are postmillennial in this church. And they know what this church is, but they like being here. I think they like the potluck, potluck Sunday or something. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I like the potluck. 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there, you, there you go. <laughs> We're not going to vote on the potluck, but we, we all kind of like the potluck. That's pretty good. All right, let me keep going. Dispensation. I remember asking my dad what is dispensationalism because I heard the word and I probably was in high school and I just kind of finally sat and talked to him about it. But a dispensation is a period of time during which, this is C.I. Schofield, a period of time during which man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. The focus is on man. A dispensation is a period of time which man is tested. So this is, you can think of this as a, a, a seven-act play where you have man in, on this stage and he fails, and man on this stage and he fails, and man on this stage and he fails. And in each stage, there's, there's different parts of what is man is responsible to do or to be. And in each one of these phases, you see this failure. And uh, Charles Ryrie, who was professor at Dallas Seminary when I was there, He's with the Lord now, but he said, A dispensation is the distinguishable economy of time in the outworking of God's purpose, including distinctive revelation, revelation, testing, failure, and judgment. Do I see these dispensations in the Bible? I really do. I think they're there. Just like I tell you, I can see when people view God as El Shaddai and they view him as Yahweh and when they view Jesus in our hearts. I just, again, this is, to me, something that you can clearly see, something that is true, but not necessarily these, the best way of looking and tying Scripture together. So let me give you this. Let me give you the seven dispensations and the time period. So from Adam all the way to the fall would be what... Covenant theology calls the covenant of works. I'm not offended by that. I just think I don't really like the word innocence. Because innocence sort of, to me, sounds neutral. That you're not bad, just you're innocent. You're, you're at zero point. Actually, God created things in a state of goodness. So I would prefer to call this a state of goodness. It doesn't really matter what you call it. But traditional dispensationalism said this is a period of innocence. And Adam and Eve were there, and the tree was put there. They were tested, and they failed. And the judgment was that God put a, a, a burning flame in front of the entrance to the Garden of Eden, and man was prohibited from, and Adam and Eve were prohibited from being there. So you have testing, revelation, testing, failure, and judgment. So then you have from the fall to Noah, you have man living according to his conscience. We're not, we're not, we don't have any great revelation that we know of other than God speaking um, to people. You know, Enoch walked with God. Um, but what we know is that man was guided by, the, by a conscience. They knew that there was a God, they knew there was right and wrong, and they know there's a judgment to come. And instead of saying, well, we know there's a God, we're going to worship this God, we know there's good and bad, we're going to do good, and we're, there's a judgment to come, so we're going to live in light of the judgment to come. Instead of saying that, they threw it all out the window, and the world became corrupt. Perhaps as, as bad as it has ever been, I don't know. And I think one of the things that was really a problem is people killing each other, because that's one of the things that was revealed to Noah in particular. Um, and the thing that was talked about with uh, those who lived during that time, Cain killed Abel, and you have those who boasted in being murderers. And God looked down from heaven and he said, the, what he looked and he saw the whole of mankind, and he said, what I see is the incl inclination of the heart of man is only evil continually. Only evil continually. So I'm going to flood the earth. So you have this living by conscience, the test, 
is you're going to live upon the earth by your conscience. They failed. They became wicked as wicked can be, and there's judgment, the flooding of the earth. And God spared Noah and uh, his three sons and the four wives uh, because of the promise that he made to the serpent and to mankind uh, in the Garden of Eden. The seed promise has to continue. It's one of the reasons why I like the seed promise, because it, it's continuing through this whole time. After Noah, you have a period of time of government. That goes all the way up to Abraham. And here, mankind was told the same thing that Adam was told, you're to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And Nimrod is one of the main leaders at this time, and he said, no, we're not going to spread out. We're going to establish mighty cities. In fact, we're going to build a tower, and we're going to build a tower to heaven. And in case there's another flood, we'll be able to perhaps uh, live through that flood. Um, but it was defiance, and it's one of the times when idolatry, which may have been a problem before, but it seems to be really emphasized during Nimrod and... Um, Nimrod and the, the tower was dedicated to Moloch. And, but uh, if you look at the Greek gods and the, and the uh, uh, Greek gods, the Egyptian gods, uh, the Sumerian gods, some of the other uh, listing of gods, we've talked about this before, but um, they're all related to Nimrod. And his wife, Semiramis, Semiramis identified herself as this the woman from whom the seed would come forth, the seed of the woman. The promise of Genesis 3.15, she claimed that for herself and claimed it for uh, Nimrod as well. I think she poisoned Nimrod and killed him. And then uh, she had uh, an illegitimate son. His name is Tammuz. You can find uh, prayers being offered to, uh, not by name, but by another name, which is Semiramis. But the... The children of Israel uh, uh, were incredibly wicked, and they worshiped Tammuz. You can see Tammuz in your Bible. He's mentioned um, because the children of Israel bought into the idolatry. But that all goes back to Nimrod. And so there's this failure, and God said, the judgment is I'm going to change the languages and spread you out throughout the whole earth. And so you have, again, you have test what God said with his word that people were to do and Nimrod and the rest of the world said no we're not going to do that and so God judged them with uh, the languages and they spread throughout the earth then God spoke to Abraham and said Abraham the promise what promise well the Genesis 15 315 promise that promise is going to be fulfilled in you well, it was going to be fulfilled in Noah, too, and it was mentioned, the seed promise was mentioned to Noah, and the seed promise was mentioned to Abraham. And he says, now I'm going to make a nation out of you, and land, nation, and blessing. And that's part of the physical promise that God spoke to, to Abraham. And um, I'm sure Abraham probably thought that the seed promise would be his son. At least that's, if I was Abraham, I would have certainly thought that. And um, so perhaps he thought Isaac was the seed promise, um, or Jacob was the seed promise. Um, but what you notice is this promise was given because he wanted the people, as all time, they should have been looking for the promise. If you go back to uh, everything after Adam all the way to Abraham, they should have been looking for the promise. Basically, the promise was forgotten. God didn't forget, but the people were not saying, you know, what are you saved by? Well, we're saved by belief in the promise. There's a man coming that is going to defeat Satan. And our hope in this world and our hope for God is that God will send this one who will save, it, it, restore things, get, fix what's wrong. But you don't really see that, and also you don't really see it in the 12 sons of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. God fights for you. Um, but you read the history of those sons, and those sons are kind of messed up. I mean, that, that's what you read, and you go, I, 
you know, you, you want the, the 12 tribes, you want these 12 to be just really outstanding characters as you move forward. They're not outstanding characters. They're just like we are. And they're sinners. And they were really not intent on the promise. I don't get any, you know, when you look at things going on, they're not all, you know, talking about the promise. The one who never forgets the promise is God. And so they go in, that family goes into Egypt, and after some time in Egypt, they become slaves. That's the judgment. So they were given the promise, the reminder that the promise would be fulfilled through them and through this nation. Did Abraham ever see the nation, land, nation, and blessing? No. Did Isaac ever see it? No. Did Jacob ever see it? No. Did the 12 sons ever see it? No. Will they see it? Well, I think they will in the, the millennial kingdom. I think they're going to see it then, those who are believers in, in this promise. But there's just this failure again, and the failure is brings you to Moses. And then you have the law. Now you have not only the promise, but in addition to the promise, you have a specific set of commandments. And so, for the first time in human history, you know exactly what God wants you to do. God said, I want you to do this, I don't want you to do that. I want you to celebrate these feasts, I don't want you to commit these sins. And so you, you have, now you have th this God revealing truth that tells you specifically about him and what he's like and the holiness of God, but also what he wants his people to be like, what this nation should be like. But this is the only promise, and this is, I think, recognized by dispensationalists as well, but this is a, a conditional covenant. It's the only one of the promises or the covenants that is conditional. And it's a national covenant given in a conditional way. And God said to them, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And if you obey me, I will bless you in every possible way. If you disobey me, I will drive you from the land. It doesn't say, if you disobey, I will throw away your salvation. This is not about salvation at this point. It's about nation. And Israel was disobedient as a nation, the northern kingdom. They were driven into Assyria. The southern kingdom... 150 some years later, something like that, um, were driven into Babylon. And they were driven out of the land. Why? Well, because of the conditional covenant. They didn't keep their part. And, um, you know, that is the judgment under the law. And that's the judgment is all of these being driven from the land. It's like, this is not working out very well for man. If you look at this, you say, under all these things, you have a continual story of man failing. And that's really true. So then you come to Jesus Christ. And the period of time after that is grace. You could call it the church. That will also be appropriate, but it's grace. And uh, we have the gospel of grace. We have more information. We have the whole of the New Testament. We have the, all the, that God commands us to do. And one of the things that's interesting today is a lot of what you see in the church of Jesus Christ, and it grieves me to say this, but what you see is apostasy. You see people not preaching the word of God, not even believing the word of God. I mean, every day I go to school, I go past a church that um, celebrates homosexuality. And it's just in front of the church. It just says, you know, come to church, we accept everybody. And, you know, you want, are you teaching the Bible verse by verse? Are you teaching and going through and teaching what God says about homosexuality in the Bible? And, you know, people will say, well, that was then, this is now, and they can do all kinds of things. But it's not just that. It's we've gotten away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, you know, the end of this grace period is really described as apostasy. And... The judgment, you could include uh, uh, not just a, a judgment 
of the whole, it's really a judgment of the whole world, would be the tribulation also that enters into this, this judgment. And then you have the millennial kingdom. Jesus Christ comes as the king. He establishes his kingdom. It's a righteous kingdom. It's a kingdom of peace. It's a kingdom of prosperity. It's a kingdom where the curse is pulled back. It's a kingdom where most people are going to live for a thousand years. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful kingdom. And at the end, Satan is going to be released and there will be a rebellion. And people who've lived in this kingdom for, for some a thousand years... There will be people born all along the way, and it's the people who are born in it. We will be there as glorified saints, but in this kingdom, they will rebel against God. And there's a judgment at the end, because these ones who join together to fight against the Lord Jesus Christ will be destroyed and then stand before him at a great white throne judgment, the final judgment. And then you have the new heavens and new earth. So this is a, a quick explanation of this. It's like seven-act play, where man stands upon the stage, mankind stands upon the stage, and is given new information, new revelation, but always in all of these, there's failure. And I can see all those periods. I call conscience sort of individualism and government. I call it collectivism. I call innocence goodness, but the promises for Abraham, the law, the church, and the kingdom. You, you can look at that and you can say, well, that's there. I just don't think it's the best way of putting the whole Bible together. And um, that blue line behind that indicates that there are carryovers that go from each of those stages. So it's not just, you know, uh, like a train with boxcars and each one is separate. There's, there's always carryovers that go from, I mean, everyone has a conscience all the way through. And, you know, everyone is to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It, it, you know, there's promises that, and requirements that continue to go through. But this is a, a big picture of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism used to be carried along, I think, by the Bible churches. I think today dispensationalism is carried along more by the charismatic churches, for whatever that's worth. But I've heard more of them talking about dispensationalism than Bible churches talking about dispensationalism. So, now I want to talk about promise theology, but we need to take a break. And let's take a break, and then we'll come back and talk about promise theology.
now that the men have taken all the windows apart and oh yeah the boys <laughs> the boys have taken it all apart <clears throat> promise theology is a system which views the promise of the seed the messiah the christ as the unifying theme of scripture revealing the true knowledge of god and the provision of jesus christ the savior and king And um, this traces the covenants. This is promise theology. And when I was at Dallas Seminary, Lewis Johnson, who may have been in contact with Kaiser, um, was sort of talking about a promise theology. And he, that promise theology it doesn't come from me, it came from him. And he was always saying, well, you, some of the you men need to write on promised theology. But it's already been written because the book has been written by Kaiser, Walt Kaiser. But it's, very, it's, it's really just saying, you know, the, it begins with the seed promise. Actually, it begins with creation, the fall, and the promise. Creation, the fall, and the promise. And in the promise, it's a promise that is made speaking to the serpent. And God says to the serpent, in the presence of the man and the woman, because the, the curse is given to the man and the woman and also to the serpent. But God says to the serpent, <clears throat> the woman that you have deceived, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head and you will bruise his heel. So again, I always like to I say this, the, the depiction is of a man, not a God man, just a man. A man is born and there's the serpent as a serpent and this man goes up and he stamps on the head of the serpent. And when he does, the serpent is destroyed. But in the process, either by stamping on his head or somehow being struck by the serpent, the man is bruised. But the serpent is destroyed. You say, well, when did that happen? Well, th that's all they knew. And that's all they knew for a very long time. So if Enoch was saved, what was Enoch saved by? He saved believing that God is going to provide a man who's going to destroy what Satan has done. That's the gospel message. Did he believe that this man was the son of God? I don't know how he could know that. He just knows it's, it's, it's a, the man of God. The, the man of God that God provides. That will crush the serpent's head. Ultimately, it's Jesus Christ, and he crushed the serpent's head at the cross. And he was bruised. Bruised in the sense that he died, and yet he was raised from the dead. Raised himself from the dead. God raised him from the dead. So really what he suffered was a bruise, not the destruction that, of the serpent. The serpent was completely annihilated by the, or destroyed by the stamping on his head. He is defeated. Satan is a defeated power. He is still around. He will still be around until the end of time. But it's just very interesting that that's the promise. And it's just a very simple promise of the seed. And I always think that this word seed should always be translated seed in the Bible. And the seed can refer to one. And when it does, that one is Jesus Christ. And it can refer to the many and when it does, it means the many who belong to Christ or the many who are in Christ. But it can refer to one and many, just like grass seed. Because if somebody said to you, oh yeah, I, planted, I cleaned up the backyard, straightened it all around, got it all level and everything, and planted grass seed. And you don't say to them, you mean one seed? <laughs> say, no, no, grass seed. Well, the word seed is used in a plural sense, we don't say grass seeds. You can say that if you want to. Probably grass seeds all over the place. But it's a seed promise. 
and it's just a simple promise. You know, and you can say, well, why, why not have the seed promise and then have the cross? The seed promise, and in the days of, you know, Adam, be Adam's son would be the seed promise, and all the rest of the time would be about the gospel. It seems much simpler. Jesus Christ comes, and you have the final judgment. I mean, if you want to do something very simple, I mean, that would be very simple. But that's not what, what he did. He made a promise, and God is a God who loves to make a promise and wait. We have a very patient God. And he is very patient with us, which is a good thing. I mean, we want God to be, you know, we're all thinking it would be nice if the Lord would come soon. The Lord needs to come. The Lord, you know, things are getting worse and worse and worse. We look at things and we say, he needs to come. But we have a very patient God. I mean, he's a God who has waited to reveal Jesus Christ for some 4,000 years. 4,000 years? That's a, that's a patient God. There's a lot of things that he did during that 4,000 years, but I mean, just it's, it's this promise, and he gives the promise, and if Adam and Eve would, I think they would expect maybe Cain or Abel or Seth or one of the many, maybe hundreds of sons and daughters, but they may have looked at one and said, I wonder which one of these is, is, the, is the seed. Because our expecta- my expectation when God gives a promise that it would be the, it right away. But God is a very patient God. He makes a promise and he waits. And why does he wait? Well, one of the ways, reasons he waits is he waits because he wants us to know that the promise comes from him and not from us. It, it's what he brings. So he lets the promise almost fade away. Almost fade away. It never can fade away because it's his promise, what he's going to do. And he doesn't keep his promise because we're worthy and because we're good at it. That's what dispensationalism very, because you see man's failure all the way through. But the promise is, is given, Genesis 3.15, this promise starts to unfold. And I speak of progressive revelation because then you have the Noahic covenant. And once again, this is related to the seed promise because the world became exceedingly sinful. You're you're at some 1,500 years when you come to the flood somewhere in there. And the wickedness of man was great upon the earth. Are they hoping for the man? No. Is there anyone hoping for the man? No, it says that Noah found grace in the sight of God, but that means God didn't find something in Noah that he said, you know, I'm going to save him because he's a good guy. God saved him because God loved him, and God saved him, and God saved his three sons and the family. It's just, you know, is, and their families. But it's very interesting that God, when Noah gets off in chapter 9, and Noah... gets out of, let me get back to Genesis chapter 9. This is a place where the word seed should be. They get off the flood. He offers a sacrifice. And uh, uh, he says, uh, everything shall be food. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh that has its blood in it. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it from the hand of every man. From the hand of every man's brother I require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man... And as for you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply. 
And God spoke with Noah and said, and his sons with him, and he said, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. That word descendants has a T by it, which means translation and off to the side. It says literal seed. I think it should be seed with a star behind that and a point over the that, and meaning your descendants. But the word is seed. And I think when the seed is mentioned here, because the seed is mentioned in Genesis 3.15, there's that connection. And also this whole idea of capital punishment. I asked the kids at school if they believe in capital punishment, and probably half do and half don't. I say capital punishment is not, is not the, taking someone and putting them to death is not the punishment. God says when someone touches the image of God and kills someone and touches the image of God by killing them, they have committed an offense against me, so send them to me. The judgment is to send that person who has committed that murder, send them to God. And I've said to you before, but one of the things that was very interesting is we used to have judges that would have a trial for someone who committed murder, condemn them, and that they were going to be executed, and the judge would give the gospel. He says, you are guilty of, of murder, and you have touched the image of God in this person that you murdered, and you're going to give an account to God, and my recommendation for you is to uh, uh, get your life right with Jesus Christ. You need to believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins because you're going to stand before him. And, that's, and then they take that person, and they, if that person has tortured ten people, you don't torture him, you just simply put him to death. And he is sent to God. And it's, this, putting him to death is not the punishment. Standing before God is the punishment. And he'll either be punished at the cross or he'll be punished at the throne. But in one of those two places, there's judgment and God will judge. But God said this whole killing, that's why I said a lot of the sin before this flood was probably related to murder. Because God says this is something that we, we need to stop, this whole murder thing, touching the image of God. When you gossip about someone, you're touching the image of God. When you steal from someone, you are touching what is the image of God. You're, you're stealing from that. So God takes things very personally, the way in which we treat one another. Very important. So, it mentions the seed. And again, this seed promise goes forward and you come to Abraham. Again, the seed is mentioned to Abraham. You go to Genesis chapter 12. And uh, he's told he's going to be given land, nation, and blessing. Uh, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And then in verse 7, it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your seed, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared before him. So you have this covenant of land, nation, and blessing. And to the descendants, he will give this land. And there will be nation and blessing. But really, he's talking about giving that land. Nobody thinks of it that way, but it's giving it to Jesus. In fact, he's going to not only give that land to Jesus, he's going to give the whole globe to Jesus because it belongs to him anyway. He's the creator. It all belongs to him. Not just a little land in the Middle East, but the whole of the earth, the whole of the universe belongs to God. And man rebelled against God thinking that he can take all this stuff away from God. He cannot. So that's why this nation, and the, he, he makes Abraham a nation. When Abraham's one person, there's no nation. He doesn't even have a son. And he doesn't have a son until it's past time of his having a son. And same for Sarah. And then God says, you will have a son. So out of nothing, God produces something. The seed promise again. And the seed promise again is repeated and Abraham is told the seed is going to be in you. So look for the promise. Look for the seed promise to be fulfilled. Totally amazing that Abraham was willing to offer, sacri- to, to offer Isaac as a sacrifice on, on the altar. Totally amazing because that's the seed promise right there. 
If Abraham kills Isaac, there is no Christ. But Abraham believed that if he killed Isaac, because God said through Isaac the seed promise will be fulfilled, that God would raise him from the dead. So I'm like, Abraham, have you ever seen a resurrection from the dead? And Abraham would say, no, I've never seen that. But God said it's going to be Isaac, so if I, he, God tells me to kill Isaac, then God's going to make Isaac come back to life. It has to be Isaac. God said it was Isaac. You can be critical of Abraham's faith, but that's a dramatic expression of Abraham's faith in believing something he's never even seen or thought about. I don't even know if he'd anybody talk about resurrection. It's just amazing. So the Abrahamic covenant is given. The Mosaic covenant is given then. And I don't put the seed under that because the seed promise is not a part of that Mosaic covenant. It shows you the need that you have for the seed. It's not a seed promise. In other words, Moses is not in the line of Christ. Abraham is, Noah is, the woman, the seed of the woman, Adam and Eve, part of the line of Christ, but not Moses. And the Mosaic Covenant, again, is a national covenant. And read Deuteronomy chapter 28 if you don't think it's a national covenant, because there's 14 verses in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that say, this is what will happen if you are obedient and you are blessed in the land. 14 verses, and then there's like 50, I don't know the number, 58 verses after that that describe what's going to happen to them if they disobey God. This is not a salvation thing. They're going to lose their salvation. It's not they're going to lose their land, nation, and blessing. They're going to lose, they're going to be spread out. And one of the reasons why God says I'm going to be, there's going to be a restoration with the prophets is because God keeps his word when man is so unfaithful. I'm so thankful that's true of us as Christians. Because the way we live the Christian life would not save any of us. It just wouldn't. Um, th there's no part of our salvation that we could do things to save ourselves. If God does not keep his word, if God does not keep his promises, we're doomed. So God puts this amazing covenant, and it's the, the other covenants are not conditional covenants. God doesn't say to Abraham, Abraham, I will give you land, nation, and blessing if you will sacrifice your son. There's, there's not anything that Abraham was to, told to do. He was told there will be land, nation, and blessing. Noah was told that the blessing is coming. The blessing has survived the flood. The blessing is still coming. The seed promise is still intact. And Moses is given this so that the people will see that if you're and this is where it's, it, it's applied to salvation in the New Testament. But in this thing, it's like saying, you can't make a relationship with God by the things that you do, nor can you keep a relationship with God by the things that you do. It's all God's promise. Because God says, I'm going to give you this promise. I'm going to give you you're to be obedient to me. Love the Lord your God with all your hearts. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you'll do those two things, just those two things, that's a summary of the law. If you just do those two things, I will bless you. They never did those two things at all. And so they were taken into captivity. So then you have the Davidic covenant. Here we find out that the seed is going to be a king. He's going to sit upon a throne. And it's shortly after the Davidic covenant with the, pro with the prophets, Daniel mentions the Messiah. I think that may be the first time Messiah is used in the Bible. But we find out that this, he's going to be a king. And with the prophets after David, you find out that he's also going to be the son of God. The son is promised. The Emmanuel, God with us. God with us? What are you talking about? Well, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Mighty God. Now we know that this Messiah is 
is not only a man, but he is God. Fully man, fully God. Fully man, yet without sin, fully God. 100%, 100%, and you're 100%. So that's hard to think about. But here's this one who is as promised. And that's one of the reasons why the children of Israel wondered, well, how will we know when the Messiah comes? What will he do? And the answer is that he will come healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, causing the lame to walk, the lepers will be healed. He's, he's going to come as the Son of God doing things that only God can do. The signs and wonders. A sign is something that points to something. It points to the fact that this is the Messiah who's doing all this healing and doing all these miracles that only God can do. That points to the fact that he is the Messiah and that what he's doing causes everybody to stand back and go, whoa. That's a sign and wonder. The sign points, the wonder goes, whoa. So you'll know who the Messiah is. He'll come doing that. And that's what Jesus Christ came doing. I'm telling you, the, the Pharisees had to know that this was really the Messiah. They had to know. Because, I mean, Jesus was doing things that none of them could do. And they watched him do the, these things. And they still, with hardness of heart, they rejected him. And they thought by killing him, they could just wipe the whole thing out. But you, you know, this is progressive. And, you know, I like, my dad always used to draw this. He drew this with disp the dispensationalism that he is. But he always used to draw this line like this, chart like this. From the beginning to the ending. And he said, you learn more and more and more, not on a steady a steady level. This actually would be sort of a straight line and then kind of goes like this and goes more like this. Straight line like, you know, I don't know how to draw that parallel, but it just, you just, there's more progressive information. You know he's a man here. You know that here, about here, that he's God. You know he's the Messiah. You know he's a king. You know these things about him because it's like God unfolds this promise. It's like a wonderful promise, and he doesn't tell it all at one time. He progressively tells it along the way. And if you ask me why he does it that way, I'll say, I don't know. You have to ask him. But he does it progressively. And you learn more and more and more. And you're accountable to believe what you know. You're accountable to believe what you know. So if someone says, well, can you just believe that Jesus is a good man? I said, no. What did Enoch believe? Well, he believed that he was a man. Enoch could be saved that way, but not today. Because you are responsible to respond to the revelation that God gives. So when you know that he is the Son of God, then you have to say, well, I not only believe that Jesus is the man, but I believe he is the Son of God. I believe that he's both of those things. So the promise unfolds. It's like this beautiful flower that just starts to flow until you come to the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there he is. So then you have the new covenant. And the new covenant is established in two phases. And the first phase is the Gentile church. Jews and Gentiles are saved, but more Gentiles than Jews. If you look at the church today, you wouldn't say, oh, it's a Jewish organization. You would say, for the most part, it is a Gentile organization, though people, Jewish people have been saved in every generation. Not many, but some. And Jews as a nation continue to reject Jesus Christ. So that's the church age. And the first phase of this is the church, where the gospel message goes forth. How do I get into the promise? Well, I get in through Jesus Christ. Because we are baptized into the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us and we are brought into the covenant promises by Jesus. You don't have a better way of getting in. Period. So the first part of this is, first 2,000 years of this is the establishment of the church. Then God is going to do a work with Israel. i just tell you, there will be, in that second phase, there will be many Gentiles who are saved. So I read the book of Revelation and you see what goes on and the many martyrs that come out of the tribulation. 
You know, it's amazing that, that many people will be saved. At the same time Satan is trying to accomplish his kingdom, the gospel message is going to go forth like it's never gone forth before. People are going to be saved. It, it, it will be amazing. And they will be killed. That's not amazing, but it's sad. But they will, most of the people that are saved miraculously will be killed disgustingly. <laughs> They're going to be murdered. And Satan has complete authority, so, I mean, he's going to find them and he's going to kill them. And if you, it's, you go to death, you go to death. It says it's just... But God is going to do that because when he made a promise to Abraham, he's going to keep his promise. And you have this tribulation period of time and then this kingdom time where God is going to show Abraham and give Abraham the land that he walked on. God told Abraham, the land you walk on, I will give to you. And they said, well, that just means... Generations later, he gave it to the nation of Israel. God said to Abraham, I'm going to give it to you. When God makes a promise, he'll keep his promise. It's one of the reasons why I think Abraham is coming back. And he'll be a part of the kingdom of God. Whether he's in glorified form or in physical form somehow, I don't know. But I do know that he's coming back. And he's going to walk in the land that God is going to give to him. And the land, the whole of the earth is going to be given to Jesus. And this, this doesn't just come to an end in, you know, just fizzle out at the end. You know, you have all these promises. You come to the end and just kind of, the, you know, the church goes into apostasy and then Jesus comes and there's... It's going to end, <coughs> excuse me, with Jesus Christ establishing all the promises and keeping all the promises that he's ever made on the earth. And that's, that's wonderful truth. Jesus Christ as Savior and King. Now, there's parts of this I want to put together for you a little better, but that's the big picture of promise theology. God making a promise and fulfilling the promise. And glory be to God, he not only fulfills the promise of sending the Lord Jesus Christ, but he saves us in, in that whole thing. And he does defeat what Satan has done. And he's going to defeat Satan, and he's going to thoroughly defeat Satan, and he's going to give Satan seven years to accomplish a kingdom, his kingdom upon the earth. And it will come to nothing because God is going to establish his kingdom and that will reign for a thousand years. More to be said about that. We're out of time, but uh, I, I, I like covenant. I like covenant theology. I like dispensational theology, but I really like promise theology because I think Christ is the key. We're always to be looking to Christ. And all the way through the time, people were to be looking to Jesus Christ. He is the coming Christ. He is the coming Messiah. He is the Savior. He's the one. We're to live and anticipate the coming of this Christ. And we're still to be looking for Christ. In every period of time, you're looking for the promised seed. And so are we. And even in the kingdom, they're going to be living with the seed. He'll be on the earth reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords like no other kingdom has ever been. A glorious kingdom. So that's promise theology. And again, I'm going to talk about some of the relationships between the law and grace and some of the other things that are seen, but that's also important to be seen. Well, we're three minutes over, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are accomplishing your purposes here upon the earth. We can look at this world and see that it is going into darkness. And we can be discouraged. We can despair. We can look at this and say, you know, what is happening? And yet we look at your word and we see that you have made promises that you are going to keep. Promises that you are going to fulfill. And this world of yours is not going to end up in the hands of sinful men. It's going to end up into the hands of Jesus Christ. You said in Ephesians, you're summing up all things in Christ. And we look forward to that great day. So we thank you for the blessings that you give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.